Who here has ever gone to a crowded mall, just sat down and people watched? It's fun because you can observe and make up little stories about the people you see. Hmm, I bet that guy's going home to his wife and two and a half kids. <laughs> that girl really likes her new dress. That guy's, ooh, it just caught him picking his nose. In everyday life, we all observe and describe behavior, often drawing conclusions about why people do what they do. And psychologists do the same thing through three descriptive methods, naturalistic observation, case studies, and surveys. Now previously, we were talking about people watching. Now this is a form of observation called naturalistic observation, where you watch and record individuals' behavior in their natural settings. Most psychologists don't go to crowded malls or airports to sit down and wait because there's too much going on and they might miss something. So instead, they come up with ways to unobtrusively monitor interactions in natural environments. They could, with consent, place video cameras that capture behavior and then they can analyze it later. Or they could use the popular device of a one-way mirror that developmental psychologists use to observe interactions of children on playgrounds. Now the methods we're talking about here merely describe behavior, they don't explain it. But really, the starting point of any science is description. And some descriptions can be rather revealing. Take for example that we once thought that humans were the only ones to use tools. Thanks to naturalistic observations, we now know that chimpanzees use sticks as tools, and they insert them into termite mounds in order to capture a tasty treat. This method of observation has really paved the way for future studies on animal language, thinking, and emotion. And it's not only expanded our understanding of animals, but of ourselves. Here's an interesting finding thanks to naturalistic observation. According to a 2001 study, we as humans laugh 30 times more often when we're in social situations more than when alone. The important thing here is that naturalistic observations offer an interesting snapshot of someone's life. But that doesn't mean that this one point in time is representative of their entire life. What if you caught that person on a bad day? You shouldn't assume that just because you caught them being sad means that they're always a depressed person. Also, naturalistic observations don't control factors that influence behavior. Since you're not manipulating anything, then you can only describe the behavior. You can't explain it. The second descriptive method is among the oldest of research methods, the case study. It's an observational technique in which one person is studied in depth in hope of revealing things true to all of us. Much of our knowledge of the brain actually comes from case studies of individuals who were suffering an impairment after damage to a certain region of the brain. One of the most famous case studies is that of Phineas Gage, a gentleman who was working on the railroad in 1848. He was packing gunpowder into a blasting hole with an iron rod when the gunpowder suddenly ignited. The explosion sent the rod up through his cheek and out through the top of his head. Now, he ended up surviving, but after a few months, people said his personality changed. His friends who knew him before the accident said he used to be sweet and charming, but afterwards they said that he turned into an ill-mannered and short-tempered individual. Now Phineas is a great example of how function, such as anger, is localized in the brain. While his case is an intense one, it shows us what can happen, and it suggests directions for future research. But just like in naturalistic observations, there are downsides to using case studies. Number one, we may not have enough information. Very little is known about Phineas from a medical standpoint after the accident, and even less from before. All we really have are testimonies from his friends saying how his personality changed. And it's not really a lot to go off of, but you have to make generalizations with what you have. Number two, the very intense cases seldom happen, and replication is out of the question. It would be pretty unethical if you start firing iron rods through people's faces just to see what happens. So you have to gather as much information as you can from one case. And as we've seen from Phineas, it may not be that much. And number three, cases may mislead us if the individual is atypical. Let's say you're doing a study on the effects of cigarette smoking, and your one case is a 95-year-old smoker with a clean bill of health. You may then assume that smoking doesn't cause cancer. 
There will always be exceptions, and it's your job as a scientist to decide if the case is representative of the greater population. The final descriptive method we're going to talk about is the survey. It's a technique to gather self-reported attitudes or behaviors of a particular group. Surveys are everywhere, from magazines to websites to after-class reviews. And while they offer a great deal of information from the public, there are some important aspects that both administrators and consumers of surveys should take into account. One tricky way of asking questions is called the wording effect that subtle changes in the order or wording of questions can have major effects. You see, people are more approving of phrases like aid to the needy more than welfare, or of affirmative action over preferential treatment. Some words may already hold connotation, whether positive or negative, and those that develop surveys can use that to their advantage. That's why as a critical thinker it's important to reflect on how the phrasing of a question might affect people's opinions. Now, it would be nearly impossible to make everyone in a population take your survey. So a good question is, how do you choose a group that actually represents a population? On top of that, you have to question what's the motivation for those that complete the survey? Are they really passionate about a specific topic? or are they just trying to win their $25 Amazon gift card? This is where random sampling comes in. It fairly represents a population because each member has an equal chance of inclusion. This is usually done by a random number generator so that every participant has an equal opportunity to be picked. The point to remember here before accepting a survey is to think critically. Look at the way they use words and phrases to see if it might influence a person's opinion and then take a look at the sample to see if it's representative of the entire population. In this video, we talked about three descriptive methods that psychologists use to describe behavior. Naturalistic observation allows us to observe and record behavior as it naturally occurs, without trying to manipulate the situation. The case study is a technique we use to observe one person in depth in hopes of revealing things true to all of us and the survey, which is a technique for gathering self-reported attitudes and behaviors of a particular group. Thank you for watching my video on the descriptive methods. If you like this, be sure to check out my other videos in my Psychology 101 segment, and keep an eye out for future videos coming out soon.